I hope you enjoy this short summary of the history of money and banking in North America. Early British colonists had little to no British currency or coins to use for trade, so they were forced to barter, which is a form of trade for goods and services without the use of currency as an intermediary device. In the case of the colonists, they traded such things as beaver skins, corn, tobacco, rice, livestock, and gunpowder in exchange for everyday goods like food, kitchen utensils, or farm equipment. However, this was a very unpopular form of trade amongst the colonists, and they much preferred to use coins or other precious metals specie, which made trade much easier. In the early 17th century, colonists who traded with the natives used wampum, which was made of seashells and used as a currency amongst themselves and amongst the Indians. For a time, it was considered legal tender and even used to pay taxes, at least until 1661. Foreign coins, such as the Spanish dollar, was very popular amongst the colonies. Also known as the Spanish piece of eight, it was divisible by eight and two bits, or a quarter dollar, is still a measure of money today. In 1652, the Massachusetts Bay Colony established an illegal mint in Boston that issued the very first coin in the colonies. But the ease of counterfeiting, or clipping, which was the practice of shaving off pieces of the coin, led to its failure. To fight clipping, a degree to add a double ring to the coin was declared. In 1680, the King of England ordered the close of this mint, and the charter of the Massachusetts Bay Colony was revoked. An early experiment in paper money happened during King William's War, a colonial war fought between French and English colonists with help from native allies. In an effort to raise armies, the British Crown in 1690 allowed the colony to pay soldiers in bills of credit. These were crudely printed bills in denominations of 5, 10, and 20 shillings that were promissory notes to pay the bearer in equal specie. By 1751, British Parliament made it illegal for colonies to issue money, but by the time the revolution broke out in 1775, the Continental Congress was issuing paper money to finance the war. These notes were backed by anticipated tax revenues after victory, on a gamble, but they issued so many that inflation made them practically worthless, leaving citizens of the newly formed nation with very little faith in paper money. One of the founding fathers of the United States was an orphan from the British West Indies, educated in the North American colonies, who we know as Alexander Hamilton. After raising his own troops as a teenager in the Revolution and named Captain, he served with and became very close to General and future President George Washington. During Washington's administration, Washington turned to young Hamilton to develop the new nation's monetary policy and appointed him as the Secretary of the Treasury. Hamilton immediately set out on his long-term goal to make the newly formed United States a major commercial and military power. He modeled his plan largely on the just defeated British. This was much to the dismay of other founding fathers, including Washington's Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson, who would prove to be a lifelong adversary to Hamilton. Hamilton's plan was a five-step plan. The first step was to establish the new nation's creditworthiness, making it desirable to loan the government money by purchasing its bonds. The second step he called on the creation of a national debt, consolidating the war debts of the Revolution and other previous debts into one new debt with new interest-bearing bonds issued to creditors. This step served to strengthen the first step up as well. For Hamilton's third step, he called for the creation of a Bank of the United States, modeled after the Bank of England. This bank would serve as the nation's main financial agent. It would be a private corporation instead of a government agency or branch. Its function would be to hold public funds, issue banknotes that would serve as currency, and make loans to the government when necessary. Also, make a tidy profit for its stockholders. In the fourth step, Hamilton proposes a tax on whiskey in order to raise revenue. Lastly, in the fifth step, Hamilton called for a tariff to be imposed on imports and suggested that government subsidies should be used to encourage the development of factories to start manufacturing at home products that were being imported from overseas. In 1791, as part of Hamilton's third step, the First Bank of the United States received a charter from the U.S. Congress for a term of 20 years. Of course, at the time, it was only called the Bank of the United States. The First Bank was publicly owned by stockholders with a 20% share belonging to the U.S. government, purchased with money loaned from the bank. The bank's total initial worth was $10 million. Foreigners were allowed to be stockholders as well, but were not allowed to vote on corporate decisions. Auditing the bank by the Treasury Department was to happen as often as once a week. The money needed to support this bank and its task of repaying war debts was provided by Hamilton's fourth step, taxing whiskey. 
which led to the famous Whiskey Rebellion, an armed protest against the tax that was put down by a militia army. A constitutional argument developed over the bank between Hamilton and Jefferson, as well as James Madison, mostly on the grounds of the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution, that any powers not expressly written in the Constitution should fall to the states. That if the framers of the Constitution had wanted a federal bank, they would have put it in the Constitution themselves. While Hamilton argued that privately owned businesses deserved the same constitutional protection as a real person. Ultimately, President Washington had to step in between this fight and make a decision. And after weighing both sides, decided the bank was constitutional and allowed the charter. In 1811, when the bank's charter was set to expire and a vote to renew it hit the Senate, they tied on the vote and the vice president cast the deciding vote against renewal, which ended the first bank of the United States. It would be five more years before our charter was issued for the second bank of the United States. During this period, the United States declared war on Great Britain and began what became known as the War of 1812. During this war, Washington, D.C. was sacked and the White House was burned and the U.S. debt grew from $45 million to $127 million by 1815. This war contributed to the massive call for a new U.S. bank. In 1816, during James Madison's administration, the second bank of the United States received its charter from Congress. Like the first bank, its charter was for 20 years. It was a privately owned corporation, with 20% of it being owned by the federal government, which was the single largest shareholder. The remaining 80% was held by 4,000 private investors, including 1,000 foreigners. While the bulk of the stock was held by just a few hundred individuals, the institution was the largest money corporation in the world. The bank established a national currency and managed 25 branches nationwide by 1832. During the presidential administration of Andrew Jackson, a famous general of the War of 1812, the bank's charter was set to expire in 1836 and a political battle known as the Bank War ensued. Jackson considered the bank to be an illegitimate corporation whose charter violated state sovereignty and posed a threat to the agriculture economy of the South. When Congress voted to renew the charter, Jackson vetoed the bill, and Jackson's campaign for a second term in office became a campaign based on the idea that a vote for Jackson was a vote against the U.S. Bank. If Jackson was re-elected, he would abolish the bank altogether, and in 1832, Jackson defeated Henry Clay and was re-elected president of the United States. Jackson quickly removed federal funds from the bank and deposited them in dozens of private banks across the country. In response to this, the Senate censured him, and a new political party emerged calling themselves Whigs. But in the end, Jackson prevailed, and in 1836, the charter expired and was not renewed. This was the beginning of the free banking era known for its lack of national presence in banking that would last until 1862. Right before this began, on January 8, 1835, another interesting thing happened during Jackson's term as president. The national debt was paid down to zero for the first and only time in U.S. history. Jackson considered both banks and debt to be enemies. He referred to them as the national curse. To pay off this debt, he sold off large amounts of the land acquired by Thomas Jefferson in the Louisiana Purchase to private parties and blocked almost all spending bills introduced by Congress. After paying off this debt, which was about $58 million when Jackson took office, the U.S. was actually running a surplus, so Jackson decided to divide the extra money amongst the individual states. Unfortunately, shortly after this, a huge real estate bubble burst, and coupled with reckless credit policies by the state banks funded by Jackson in 1837, the U.S. fell into a depression that lasted until 1844. During this depression, which is known to historians as the Panic of 1837, profits, prices, and wages went down while unemployment is believed to have reached 25%. Banks refused to redeem currency for full face value, banks collapsed, businesses failed, and thousands of workers lost jobs. Riots and major domestic unrest resulted in an increase in professional police forces in many major cities. The 8th President of the United States, Martin Van Buren, inherited this crisis from Jackson, but he continued Jackson's policies and refused to allow a charter for a third bank of the United States. Instead, he moved federal funds from state banks into an independent treasury. But this failed to end the Depression, and in 1840, it cost him his bid for re-election. Instead, a Whig by the name of William Henry Harrison was elected and then died a month after taking office which led to a constitutional crisis of secession to the office of the presidency.
When Harrison's vice president, John Tyler, assumed the role of president, he was expected to carry on Whig policies and repeal Van Buren's independent treasury. Instead, he vetoed both Congress's efforts to restore the U.S. Bank and to pass the National Banking Act. Tyler received hundreds of death threats over this during his four years in the White House. His fight with Congress over the U.S. Bank and his role in passing the tariff of 1842 prompted Congress to initiate the very first impeachment attempt in U.S. history. The impeachment was unsuccessful, and by the end of Tyler's term, the nation was in recovery. And for the next 10 years, things were relatively stable and even prosperous in the early to mid-1850s. But by 1857, the global economy felt its first worldwide economic crisis, this and the sinking of the SS Central America, a ship loaded with much-needed gold for New York banks, led the U.S. into what is known as the Panic of 1857, from which the U.S. economy did not recover from until after the Civil War. Before the Civil War, the only money issued by the U.S. government was gold and silver specie coins. They were considered legal tender, meaning people had to accept them for payments. Paper currency in the form of banknotes were issued by private banks, but they were not legal tender and were only as reliable as the bank who issued them. If that bank failed, they would not be able to redeem these notes for specie, and it would be worthless. To fund the Civil War, President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, attempted to borrow money from major banks, but the banks demanded interest rates as high as 36%, and Lincoln refused. Keep in mind that since the end of the Second Bank of the United States, the federal government had no bank to go to to borrow money easily and on its terms. In July 1861, Congress approved the printing of $50 million worth of demand notes that could be redeemed for specie on demand. These notes were printed on both sides, the reverse in green ink, and became known as greenbacks. By December, only five months after their creation, the government was unable to continue redeeming them for gold, and they became less popular. But by March of the next year, they were made legal tender. Because greenbacks were used to pay customs duty, most of them had left domestic circulation by 1863. But Lincoln, still faced with funding the Civil War and not wanting to borrow money, led Congress to pass the first Legal Tender Act in February 1862. This authorized the printing of $150 million in United States notes. Also known as greenbacks, these notes were printed from 1862 to 1871. But unlike the original greenbacks, these notes were not backed by gold, but were fiat currency, meaning they were only backed by a promise. What started it as only $150 million of them became almost $500 million worth in this circulation. Meanwhile, in the South, the Confederate States of America had their own war to fund and monetary policy to manage. Because the South seceded under the ideas of states' rights, the Southern states resisted efforts to centralize funds by Confederate President Jefferson Davis. The South had many different private banks printing banknotes, and collecting taxes was incredibly difficult. These conditions led to borrowing money and taxing citizens to fail to finance the war, and the Confederacy had to resort to printing excessive amounts of money which led to hyperinflation. This excessive printing was accompanied by a serious counterfeiting problem, but because of the need for ever more currency, these counterfeit bills were often accepted as well. Southern women even resorted to riots and looting in the South, in events known as the Southern Bread Riots. Price levels grew at a rate of almost 10% per month, or 92% by the end of the war. Unlike the South, the North was able to raise $2.3 billion to fund its war effort without causing hyperinflation, but it did enact the United States' very first federal income tax as well. This was called the Revenue Act of 1861 and stayed in effect until it was repealed by Congress in 1871. In 1875, Congress passed the Specie Payment Resumption Act and contracted greenback circulation and required government to redeem them for gold. In 1870s and 1880s, the United States experienced economic growth and expansion known as the Gilded Age because it was also an era of severe poverty and inequality, and of course the South's economy was still largely devastated. By the 1890s, however, prosperity would come to an end and the nation would experience another depression known as the Panic of 1893. People rushed to withdraw their money from the banks in a phenomenon known as bank runs. Stock prices declined. 500 banks closed, and 15,000 businesses failed. Unemployment rates rose to as much as 43% in some states. 
To ease the pain of this depression, President Grover Cleveland resorted to borrowing $65 million in gold from the Rothschild banking family of England and a U.S. banker by the name of J.P. Morgan, a man who had paid a replacement to serve in his stead during the Civil War and made profits selling defective rifles to the Union Army. In 1894, Congress enacted a flat-rate federal income tax, but it was ruled unconstitutional a year later by the Supreme Court. But in 1909, Congress passed the 16th Amendment to the Constitution, which was ratified in February 1913 and allowed the federal government to tax income of individual citizens. During the election year of 1912, a Democrat by the name of Woodrow Wilson was elected president. His Democratic Party also won a majority in Congress. This allowed for some drastic changes in policy. In December 1913, Congress passed the Federal Reserve Act, which recreated the Federal Reserve System and the central banking system, not seen in almost 80 years since the second U.S. bank's charter expired in 1836. Like the first and second banks, the Federal Reserve is a privately owned bank owned by stockholders. But unlike those previous banks, this one is run by a government-appointed Federal Reserve Board whose seven members are chosen by the President and confirmed by the U.S. Senate. Like the first two banks, the Fed was given a 20-year charter, but unlike its predecessors, in 1927, six years before the end of the charter, Congress voted to amend this clause and, I quote, to have secession until dissolved by an act of Congress or until forfeiture of franchise for violation of law, unquote. To this day, the Federal Reserve notes issued by this private bank are legal tender, and commonly known as the United States dollar.